morning as he comes to share your good news. And we ask that we would leave here um, encouraged knowing you better and loving you more. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Let's hear it for Blake. <clears throat> wow, good job, Blake. Uh, good job, you guys. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for getting up early. <clears throat> Thanks for being a part of this. It takes a special guy to get up early and to come to a Bible study on a Friday morning. It takes a real special guy to get up early and come speak on a Friday morning <laughs> at uh, early in the morning. Hey, it's great to, uh, glad you're here. Luke 15 is where we are. Luke chapter 15. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going through the gospel of Luke, and, and, and today is... Uh, Luke, uh, it's actually the story of the prodigal son. And of course, I think everybody, if you've been in church at all, if you've been in church all your life, you've heard this story 10,000 times. And uh, you, uh, even if you're not, um, uh, most people have heard just the idea of the prodigal son and the story and, and all of that is just, uh, it's, it's just a great passage of scripture we're going to do. Uh, just that passage about the uh, prodigal son, uh, chapter 15, verses 11 through 20, 24, is mainly what we're going to do today. Um, we'll mention the elder uh, brother in verses 25 through 32 as well, but uh, mainly that. But this is, it's, uh, this is obviously, there's a context of this story, and, there, and, and, and the story of the prodigal son is... It's one of the three stories that Jesus is telling, and he's, he's telling the um, uh, verse 1 of chapter 15 it tells us who Jesus is telling the story to. And now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. The Pharisees and the scribes were always grumbling and always, always against Jesus and just didn't, didn't like uh, who he was what he was saying, and of course, they, uh, their main complaint here is, verse 2, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners, and he eats with them. <clears throat> and uh, this, they make that as a major slam against Jesus, but uh, men, aren't you glad Jesus Christ receives sinners and eats with us? And if we're not he, he's knocking at the door. And if we open the door, you know, he'll come in and he'll sup with us and, and you with him and him with you. And we can have a relationship with him. They make it as a slab, but that's the greatest thing you can possibly say about the Lord Jesus. And it's why he came. And so he's going to tell them three stories. And, and it's all about lost things. Three things are lost. There's a sheep that's lost. The shepherd goes and, and finds the sheep. There's a coin loss. And the lady of the house uh, does everything, sweeps everything, looks everywhere to find that coin. And then there's a lost son and, uh, who, who goes away. And he is uh, going to be uh, found as well. But his point is, uh, Jesus is telling them what God is like, what the Father is like. What the Father is like is he he loves things that were lost but now have been found. And things that were dead and now are alive. And he delights in that and the joy of that. And, 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 and this is all about something lost, all about something being found, and then all about all the rejoicing happened as a result of this lost thing being found. And, 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 and it says in all three of these stories, when the thing is found, the... Uh, uh, a sheep or the coin or the boy, uh, the lost thing is rejoicing because he's been found. The one who found them is rejoicing because they were a part of founding the thing that was lost and now they've been found. They, uh, all of these get their neighbors around them and, and everybody is rejoicing with that. And then it says in, in all three stories, all of heaven rejoices. All of heaven is rejoicing in this thing. And the, and the a bottom line is that God loves us and he delights in us. He's find, he finds his pleasure in us. He enjoys us. He, is, he wants to have a relationship with us. But the, 
Of course, I think everybody knows, hey, God, God loves us. Yeah, God has to love us. I mean, God's love and, 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 and for God so loved the world, all that. But there's a, another dimension in this is that it is this idea. Man, God, God delights in you. He delights. He finds pleasure in you. He, he loves you. You're, you're precious to him. I can see that you don't believe me. So listen to these, 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 these verses. Psalm 16, 3. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, the Bible says. God says, and whom is all my delight, he says. He loves those who are his. He delights in them. Proverbs 8, 31. Rejoicing. In, in his inhabited word, and delighting in the children of men. He delights in us. It's Deuteronomy 30, verse 9. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, in blessing you, as he took delight in your fathers. And Zephaniah three seventeen. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will give you by his love. He will, he will exult over you with his singing. He delights in us. Isaiah 62, 4 actually makes this blunt fact statement. The Lord delights in you, and uh, he, he delights in us. You know, it, it's, it's, it's um, and, and obviously this boy is going to be lost that we're going to look at. And he's he's going to be a far a country. He's going to be dominated by sin. He's going to end, end up with nothing of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, nothing, and uh, he's going to come back home. But the point of all of this is that, that uh, it's, it's, it's uh, 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 in this story, the father never stops loving the boy, ever. He delights in the boy. And you know, men, it, it's an interesting thought. If you just think, how do you feel God feels about you Right after you committed a sin against that God. That's a pretty good thought. That's a pretty good statement. How do you think God feels about you in that moment? Most guys will say, well, I think obviously I did a dumb, stupid thing. I think he's mad at me. Or some guys just think, you know, I think, I think he's, he's, he's sad. He's just disappointed in, in, in me. Oh, he did the same old thing. This guy did the same, same stuff. He does 10,000 times. When's he going to learn? He's mad. He's sad. He's disappointed. He just, all of those things. You know what the Bible says in, in this story? And, and, and actually, he's telling them the story to, to shock these scribes and Pharisees. Because the bottom line is this boy is guilty of all of this stuff, but it never, it never changes the point of how God feels about that boy, how the father feels about that boy, how God feels about it. He loves us, and he delights in us. And men, uh, you know what's huge about that? If my understanding of God is, when I sin, when I do whatever it is, God is mad at me, and God is angry at me, you know, it just kind of makes me just afraid to go home. Until you realize, you know what, if I understand God loves me, even in this moment of, of, of sin and rebellion and weakness and, and whatever it is, God loves me. My father is still there. He's still waiting, and he wants me to come home. He del and it's more than just he loves me. He delights in me. He has pleasure even in my state of sin. You know what? I say, hey, I'm going home. You know, ultimately, this boy decides to go home. Now, this boy is going to decide to go home. Even though he's, a, he's in a mess, he's got a, nothing, the badness of his whole situation. But ultimately, the boy doesn't decide to go home because he's got no place else to go. That's the factor, but that's not the ultimate reason. Ultimately, the boy decides, I'm going to go home because of the goodness of his father. And he realizes, you know what, even my father's servants have more than I have. And he realizes, you know what, maybe my Father is not the bad person I thought he was. I met with two guys this week who just, I mean, one guy's 43, the other guy's 57. Both guys. 
rebellion against God. One guy, not as bad as the other guy. I mean, it's, it's a degree. It doesn't matter how bad. But one guy has a life of addiction, life, all that kind of stuff. And just boom, that's where they are. He's 43 years old. He's got really nothing. Everything, everything's messed up. 50 to 70 year old guy is not addicted to everything like this guy is. But he's got all this stuff in his life. And they just, they just always kind of thought, saw all this Jesus stuff and all these guys doing this Jesus, and, and, it's, and they always thought of God, hey, he's a killjoy. Hey, he, he said, don't do this stuff. And, and, and the whole concept of, of Jesus is, Jesus is just not a good God. And I'm just, uh, so they've run to their own thing, done their own thing, and then and then I just kind of shared with them, and I heard myself saying to them, you know what? I think one of the things that you've missed is just seeing how beautiful, how wonderful the Lord Jesus is. And not just seeing how wonderful and beautiful and glorious the Lord Jesus is, how wonderful and beautiful life is living in a personal relationship with Jesus. That's the result. This guy says, I don't want a relationship with God. And his, his uh, uh, father, so he goes to the far country and just does all the stuff, and then he's got nothing. And, and he starts to think, you know what? Maybe my God is a wonderful, my father is wonderful, my God is good. Well, let's, uh, all that's just intro. And uh, um, I, you know the story well, and, and I'm going to, I kind of just divide it up uh, real quick in, in this outline, but um, let me just read read uh, this, okay? Because we got three three uh, I guess uh, points. We always have three points, and uh, one uh, each one has has two points in it. First point is um, um, what the sun does. The, the uh, I forgot what I called it. Uh, oh, choice is made. Everyone makes a choice. The men, you get to choose what you want to do. Well, the boy makes a choice. And then uh, God makes a choice. And then second is the far country. What's happening in the far country? What happens to the boy in the far country? Then, under that, what God is doing when the boy is in the far country. Of course, ultimately, he's doing the exact same thing, loving the boy. And then uh, a third is the way back home, what the boy does when he decides, you know what, my dad is good, I'm going back home. And then what the father does, which is glorious. And you know what, all of this, the bottom line, all of this is a picture of God's grace. This is who our God is. Our God is a God of grace. Our God does what this father does in this story Jesus is, is saying because, because uh, basically Jesus is telling the scribes and Pharisees, hey, you don't know what my God, my father, our God is like. This is what he's like. And he's telling all this story and the story is so amazing. Essentially, he, he wants to shock them in the glorious, wonderful, good news of the grace of our God. He loves us. That's what God is like, he's saying in this story. That's what, uh, that's what God does. That's what he, he'll do for you. This whole thing is going to shock the scribes and Pharisees. I pray it shocks you and me in, in this thing. It blows you away. And we'll understand truly and, and fully and forever that our God loves us. He, he delights in us and he is pleased with us. And he wants us to experience him personally in life as we believe him, as we trust him, and to experience the life he wants to bless us with. That's the bottom line of this whole thing. Well, here's what he says, verse, verse 11, chapter 15. I've kind of blown my whole time on, on, on the uh, introduction. And he says this, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them, that's crucial, the younger of them said to them, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, my inheritance. Now, the old, the, uh, uh, most of the inheritance goes to the older son. This is the younger son who just says, hey, 
Uh, Father, I've been in your house. I've been blessed. I've, I've got more than I could possibly ever want everything, but I don't want to be here, and I want to what is rightfully, I think, is mine, even though it's, it's yours, but, but I want it. I want my share of it. So he makes a choice. He basically says, hey, I don't want to be here with you. I want out of this thing. I want my own thing. So he makes a choice. I want to do my own thing. And this request is going to shock the scribes and Pharisees. because This is a Jewish family that Jesus is talking about and a Jewish boy. He makes this selfish request. Actually, it's a sinful request. Actually, it's a shocking request because a Jewish boy would never do that. And it's a shameful request and it's dishonoring to the, the father, the, the family, and their faith. And he's asking for something that, that actually can't happen because normally the son doesn't get this until the father dies. So he's basically saying, I wish you were dead. And essentially he's rejecting the father. He resents the father. He despises the father. And, and uh, he rejects him. Basically he wants, hey, I want all the stuff. I don't want God in my life. I don't want the rules of my dad. I don't want any restraints, no rules, no regulations. I want to do whatever I want to do, my own thing. I don't want you. I want your stuff. I don't want you, and I want to do my own thing, and I want to go off in, in, in the far country. That is exactly what the world has done. Thomas Huxley said, this is a great quote, a man's worst difficulties begin when he's able to do just as he likes to do. If he has a situation, he can do whatever he wants to do. Our world has said, hey, we don't want God in our lives. We don't want God in our schools. We don't want God in our courtroom. We don't want God in our We don't want God. We don't want a restricted lifestyle. We don't want this righteousness stuff. We don't want the Bible. We want God, God. Now the world still says, hey, we want the blessings of God. We want the healing of God. We want the protection of God. We just don't want God. That's what this boy says. He makes a choice. You know, one of the things which is, is, is it's just a deep, theological discussion about uh, man's free will. I mean, it's pretty amazing that God, who, who, who could and can control everything, I mean, he orchestrated the whole universe. Things happen the way they happen because that's the way they're supposed to happen. And ultimately, they don't have a choice. It happens. It's just the whole thing happens like that. We he could have made a man that way too, that a man essentially is a robot. But God, for some reason, in his sovereign will, in, in, in in his wisdom, he decided, no, I'm going to give a man a choice, a man of free will, and a man can do whatever he wants to do with his life. And so many men, almost every man decided, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. This is God. I don't want this God. All this stuff this boy did, I'm making a choice, and my choice is I'm going to reject Jesus, reject all of this, and I'm going to go my own way. You can do that, men, and most men do. And most of us in this room, we, we have lived that life. And he says, I'm out of here. The boy makes a choice, and he chooses against God, and he goes and does his own thing. But of course, everybody knows, hey, a choice means a consequence. Well, the father makes a choice also. You know what he did? Look at this in the verse 12. He divides his property between them. He didn't have to do that. Legally, he didn't have to do that, but he did. The father gave the son what the son asked for. Of course, that shocked all these, these Pharisees and scribes and everybody because, because he's going to love him. It doesn't matter. He's going to love him. Even if the boy doesn't love him, he's going to love him because, he loves, because God loves us as the father loves his boy with an everlasting love, an unconditional love. He's going to love him a forever kind of love. It's the love the Bible says bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. The father loves this boy. This father, essentially, as God has for us, he has created this boy. It's his by birth, by blood. He has blessed him with everything he has in his entire life, all the good stuff. And he knew this boy's going to make this choice, and the father knows, as God knows about us, he's making this choice, but he, the father knows, and men, God knows, making a choice against God, God knows it's not going to end well. It's going to be a disaster. But the father loved the boy enough to let him go. Hey, 
The point is, son can do whatever he wants to do. And the son says, I'm spitting in your face. I wish you were dead and I'm out of here. The father says, I still love you. And I will always love you. Yes, the boy gets to choose the father. God gets to choose as well. And God chooses to love the son that never stops love. You know, it's, it, it's essentially like this. And, and obviously we have, have talked about this before. But, but, but God could choose to... Uh, uh, deal with us any way he wants to. He could decide to deal with uh, us with justice. Uh, you don't want justice. You don't want God dealing with you according to justice. Because justice means, hey, uh, uh, you sin, you die. The wages of sin is death, right? Well, justice means, hey, you violate God's law. You're punished. You're out of here. God could have said, hey, I'm going to deal with a man. I'm going to deal with this boy According to justice, he's leaving. I'm going to zap him and he's going to die. Or God could say, you know, I'm going to deal with him um, in mercy. And, and ultimately, God deals with us in mercy. Mean, hey, wages of sin is death, but the mercy part is you don't die right now. You could die. You sin, you die. You're burned up. God said, well, there's a curse on the world that, that sin. And uh, there is death, separation from God. But, but the mercy is you don't die right now. Uh, justice is we get what we deserve. Mercy is we don't get all that we deserve. Grace is we get what we do not deserve, which is to be loved, to be delighted in by a God who loves us unconditionally, just see. He just got, the father decides, and God decides, I'm going to love this boy. I'm never going to stop loving this boy. I'm going to look for him. I'm going to be hopefully coming back, looking for him until he turns. I want God to, uh, this a boy to experience the fullness of all the things I have for him. He never, God decides, he chooses, I'm going to love him regardless. Men, never forget, God always loves you. Never has stopped loving you. And he, and he delights in you. He created you. He died for you. He's got a plan for your life. He loves you. Here's what happens. In the far country, though, look at this, verse uh, 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey to a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. You know, it's interesting. He doesn't really qualify what all that means. But, God and his, but the elder son later on uh, says down, he's mad because the son comes back and his uh, father uh, forgave me. And he says, hey, why would you do this for your son of yours who's devoured your property with prostitutes? An older son just knew what this guy would did. He, uh, he just is in rebellion, lost everything through reckless living, ungodly living, just shameful in everything he did. And, and just, just as bad as you can get, he, he essentially said, hey, I'm going to do what sin does. Sin always leads where sin leads, and sin always leads to a bad place, a bad situation. Both of these guys who talked to me this week, who came to say, this is just, hey, why are they in my office? Because they're in a bad place. They just made all these choices, and, and, and now it's a disaster. And they've got all this stuff happening in their life. What Jesus is, is picturing here is he's, he's picturing for the... the um, Scribes and Pharisees, the worst possible scenario of a boy, you would assume, who did so much stuff, who was so dirty spiritually, who was so sinful, who was so ungodly, who just, all of this, he's now in a pigsty, a result of his lifestyle. You would just assume the scribes and Pharisees were, were saying, there's no way the father takes this guy back. But Jesus is saying, yes, God, God is that kind of God who loves this boy even in this situation. You know what? This boy never dreamed that the far country is going to be what it was. He was expecting it to be the best time of his life, ended up to being the worst. And what happens after that? A famine comes, and uh, verse 14, when he has spent everything, he's got nothing left. A severe famine arose in, in that country. You just wonder if God didn't have a hand in that. And he began to be in need. He's got nothing. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him in the fields to feed the pigs. The worst possible. Again, these are 
uh, uh, scribes and Pharisees, Jews, and, and the worst thing you would do, you don't even eat a pig, much less live with the pigs and, 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 and eat with the pigs, eat with the pigs eat. It, it, it's the worst possible scenario. Verse 16 says, and this boy was longing to be fed with the pods the pigs ate because he didn't have anything for him. The delight was because he didn't have anything. The best thing he had, what he was excited about, was the worst possible meal you can have, the, a pig food. And it says no one gave him anything. He's got nothing now. A boy is it, it, just in a state that uh, it's the worst of the worst of the worst. Sin promises freedom always has. Sin always brings slavery, but always does. Sin promises success, it always brings failure. Sin promises life, but the wages of sin is death. The, the boy thought he would find himself by doing his own thing, rejecting God, going to the far country. The point is he lost himself. So what does the uh, father do, this boy? As Jesus just, as he's telling this story, he just painted the most worst scenario possible of a boy who does not deserve anything from God. But what the father does, he keeps loving, always loving, always watching, always hopeful, always wanting the best for the boy and from the boy. Never changes, loves it with everlasting God. Ephesians 2, 4, 5, and 6 says this, but God is rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive with Christ. By grace we have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. It's Romans 5, 6, 8, and 10, one of the great statements in all the Bible. For while we were still weak, at that time Christ died for us, the ungodly. But God shows his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10, for if, Romans 5, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. You know, a, a fascinating statement in John 17, 23, just before the, the crucifixion and the arrest of Jesus and all that stuff, and all the disciples are going to fail and they're all going to run and, and they're going to reject God, all that stuff. Jesus makes this statement in John 17, 23. Jesus said, I in them, Lord, and you in me, that they may become perfectly so that the world may know that you sent me and, 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 and that you love them even as you love me. Now, these men are about to fail miserably on that night. Yet he says, God, just how much you love me and God, you love them, these men, just as much as you love me. Well, they, um, this this. Boy realizes, hey, I'm not in a good place. He realized, I got nobody. I got nowhere to turn. This, this scene is awful. I'm, I'm in. It, this life is anything but a beautiful. It's a disaster. It's, it's death. It's depression. It's addiction. His life and his father and all of a sudden, he sees all of that differently. He saw all of that before. It's going to be awesome. Now he sees all of this, this life, as awful as it is, and the end result, there's nothing there. But now, ultimately, he sees his father differently, and he realizes even my father's servants have what. So he decides, you know what? I am going home. And it actually says, verse 17, but when he came to himself, he had lost himself, and now he's coming back to himself because he's going back to the one who created him. And he said, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I'm going to say to him, what is he going to do? He's, he's going to uh, give his dad a speech. Why is his, his dad, he hopes he's going to take him back? Because the boy is thinking, I don't deserve anything my dad has because I've abused him. I, I've hurt him. I, I've, I've rejected him. So I don't deserve anything. So he thinks, i got to earn this thing back. That's what he's thinking. So here's what he says. Three points in this message. Again, three points. There's always three points. Uh, uh, three things he says. He says, here's what he says in the verse 18. I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. That's the first thing he says. I've sinned. Two, he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He, he says, Father, I've sinned against you. Two, I'm not worthy uh, to be your son. Third, he says, treat me as one of your hired servants. Uh, 
He thinks, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve it. I've got to work my way to back into your good grace, and, 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 and it's got to be earned. I've got to deserve this thing. Well, uh, his first statement is, I have sinned. You know what? I mean, um, if you're coming back to Jesus, that's where you start. You say, I have sinned. The boy is right there. I have sinned. He has sinned. And with this statement, this attitude, this, this uh, reflection of the heart is going to change everything. I've sinned. And then he says, I'm not worthy. That statement is also true. He's not worthy. Men, we are never worthy. I wasn't worthy when I trusted Jesus Christ this psalm more in high school. I wasn't worthy now. I'm not worthy ever. I, I will never be worthy to get heaven and eternal life and a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. But we don't have to be worthy because Jesus loves us just like we are. And so his, his third point is, hire me. Now, treat me as one of your staff. That's what he's going to say. So here's what happens. That's what the boy decides he's got to do. Then this is what the father decides he's going to do. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way away, and then five great things that the father does. His father, one, saw him. His father felt compassion for him. That's the second thing. His father ran toward him. That's the third thing. His father embraced him, hugged him, and his father kissed him. And the son decided, i got to make my speech. Verse 21, so he starts his speech. And the son to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm a sinner. Two, I'm not longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, but the father said, What's fascinating there, he's got three points. He mentioned the first two, which are true. I'm a sinner. I'm a worthy. And he's about to say, hey, I'm not uh, Hire me back. Let me work to get into graces. But the uh, father interjects, interrupts him, and never lets him say, say the third point. And the father does this. This is what the father does. The boy's expecting the worst. The father says, verse um, 22, and the father said to his servant, Bring quickly the best robe. That's one. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. That's three. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat. For this is my son was dead as alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. It's just uh, five things uh, the father did. And the shocking thing is these uh, scribes and Pharisees, these Jewish leaders, had no idea there's a God in heaven who sees everything, feels compassion, loves, runs, a God who runs, a God who hugs humanity, and a God who kisses that who Jesus said. That's who our God is. He sees, he knows everything. Man, he's always looking. He, he, he's always anticipating. And he loves you. He feels compassion. He always has. He never didn't. And he takes you and he's running toward you. If we take a step toward him, and then he hugs us. You know how, man, you know how awesome it is to be hugged by a godly man in your life, your dad, your dear friend. I mean, it's indescribable. Man, he's saying, God loves you. And he hugs you, wraps his arm around you. Man, there ain't nothing like that in all the world. And then you know what else he does? Man, listen to this. You know what he does? He kissed him. Now, I want you to imagine this boy, how messed up he was on the inside, but how, 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 uh, how uh, dirty he was on, uh, how messed up he was on the inside, how dirty he was on the outside. Been living with pigs. I'm talking pig dump. Just as gross as you can get. What's not shocking, I mean, it's shocking that, hey, the dad's going to kiss him. You can maybe think, hey, hey, son, go get cleaned up, come back, I'll hug you and kiss you. The shocking thing was just in the miserable, awful, ungodly, unrighteous, stinking, gross self as he was, the father grabbed him up in that hug and the father kissed him. Hey. I, I, this, this is a stupid uh, example, but it just popped in my head. My, my uh, granddaughter, she's a senior in high school. She played basketball and all this. It, man, it, it, one of the best rides in my life, watching her play. She was good. But after the game, win or lose, after the game, I find her. I always 
wait for her out there. And she walks in, and, and you know, I'm sick. First thing I do is I just grab her, and she comes toward me, and I kiss her on the forehead. It's always kind of gross. <laughs> it's a sweaty, you know, I mean, she's got you know, sweat and all the stuff from the game and everything, and her hair is kind of thumping, and, and of course her hair is hanging down, since sometimes you get some of that, and you know, spitting on that. <laughs> but you know what? Every time I do it, uh, and I've, I've told her this, it just reminds me how much I love Lily Marie Patterson. That's our God who loves And then he does this, and we got to stop. Then he does this. This boy is expecting nothing coming back. And it says, the dad says, bring the best robe. Bring the best. He's expecting the worst. He's getting the best. I mean, you come to Jesus, you're expecting the worst. You know what you're, you're going to get the best that Almighty God has for you in life, in living. He brings the best. And, and the elder son is, is mad about this because he knows, hey, we only saved this best robe for the governor. Some big shot. This boy has no right to this thing. But the father says, no, that's, our God. that's grace. And he puts a ring on his hand. Hey. Nor they simply means, hey, this boy now because he's got the ring, he said that the dad gave him the credit card. He's got everything he needs now. Our God, men, has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in all the heavenlies. Everything you need to be the man God wants you to be, that God created you to be, the man you need to be, the husband you need to be, to love your wife the way a man's supposed to love your wife, to raise your kids, to walk in holiness, all of that. We have the, the signet ring. We belong to him. We have the authority of Almighty God. It's what Jesus said in Matthew 20. All authority I have in heaven, and I'm giving it to you, men. And then put shoes on his feet. Slaves didn't wear shoes. Sons did. He's now a son of the father in the family. And we're going to celebrate. They could have had a funeral meal. Now they're going to have a festive party. And we are going to celebrate. Why? Because my son was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost. How about he's found? Well, man, I want... You know, both of those guys this week got on their knees in my office and trusted Jesus Christ. And both of them have done something in the past. They made a commitment somewhere down the road and did something, but, you know, each of them said, I'm not sure what I did. I'm not sure. I, I, to be honest with you, they said, I don't know where I was. I said, well, let's do it right now, and you'll know forevermore where you were, who was there, and you're going to say it out loud, so I'm going to, I'm going to be a witness to what's going to happen today in your life. Come back to Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus is wonderful. He's beautiful. Following him, you get the life God created you to live. That's what I want. Well, um, you know, we got some uh, questions to go through, and, and after, after a few minutes, I'll lead us in prayer. And I, I actually, I, I forgot what the questions are. One is, Everyone's got a prodigal story. We want you to share just a briefly, just, just, just in a few seconds, your, your prodigal story. Uh, share about grace. Man, how grace has changed your heart and life. A chain, maybe share this. You know, you know where I need to give grace? This is stupid. I need to be more conscious every moment of every day of just giving my wife grace. You know what I've discovered about myself? I don't like this about me. You know, I want to be right. And it's sad to say she's always right. And I hate that. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, most of the time I, I like that because you know, it's good to have someone who's smarter than I am in the family and those things. But you know, every now and then, you know what I do? And, and, and this is so stupid. I'll uh, just, we're in an argument or talking about something, and all of a sudden I'll discover with, with something else, you know what, hey, actually I was right. I am so excited about going and just proving to her, you're wrong this time. How sinful and stupid is that? Hey, just give her grace. 
because sometimes he didn't, oh no, I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I was about to say sometimes he doesn't do it exactly right. She does it exactly right every single time. Hey, just give grace. I've been giving grace. Why wouldn't we give grace, man, to people around us? And then, hey, there are three personalities in this story. You've got the father. God, I want to be like this father. You got the son. Man, if I'm still in that far country, I'm coming to my senses, coming to myself, I'm going home. There's the elder brother who is mad and angry about everything. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be a grumpy old man who's just mad and angry. I, I want to be a man who's been so forgiven, so full of grace that I give. I live grace, I talk grace, I speak grace, and I share grace. It's just uh, be that. Well, take eight minutes and just kind of share around your tables and talk, and then I'll close this up. Uh, uh, and just kind of share your heart for a couple of minutes with one another.
All right. Uh, let me wrap it up and uh, just pray. Uh, you know, just before, uh, yeah, if you want to kneel, uh, go ahead and kneel if you want to, and I'll, I'll lead us in a prayer. <clears throat> you know, uh, every one of us has been the prodigal son, and we've all been away from the Lord. <laughs> before we met Jesus, and before we confessed our sin and got right with God. All of us were in that far country. And every one of us in the room have got stories. I just like this prodigal son, this boy that came home, he, 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 um, uh, he had a story of how bad it was in his life. But now he's got a greater story because he, he has a greater story of what God has done in his life. And the blessings and, and the, the peace and just all that God has for him in, in, in personally and then in living and the life he's living. So if a man is here this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus and you know in your heart of hearts you're still in the far country, man, you're already on your knees. I just confess your sins before Jesus. Lord, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And Jesus, I now realize that you are the Savior, the Savior of the world, who if I confess you, confess my sin, you'll come into my life, forgive me of my sin, cleanse me, make me a new person, and give me, a, make me the man you wanted me to be to live the life I'm supposed to live, and give me the gift of eternal life. God, I pray somebody has prayed that prayer, and all of heaven is rejoicing one who was uh, blind, but now they see, and dead, and now they're alive. God, I pray for us. I pray, pray for me. God, thank you for what you've done in my heart and my life. And just, uh, just that um, I thank you for getting me a, to a point where I knew I needed Jesus, and I, I trusted him as my Savior. And God, I thank you for helping me just, just to say, you know, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to do life his way and just read his word and then, then obey it and, and just believe it and obey it and just walk in it. And God, help, help me to be faithful to you. And God, if I'm faithful to you, then I'm going to be that man that I need to be, that Sheila needs for me to be. And my three kids and their spouses, my 12 grandkids, were just, I, just to be the man in their lives and to live a godly life. God bless these guys today. Help us to honor you today in everything we do. May we be ready with the witness to always give a reason for the hope that's within us and to tell somebody about Jesus. And God, I bless this weekend services here and all around the world. May you be lifted up. God, may you do a work in the lives of men all over the globe. And we'll see an uprising, just revival, a spiritual awakening of, of men. Who just at, 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 at just such a time at this in history would just I stand up and be the man God created them to be. God bless us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for.